we come out of that grave Rise up in that amazing grace Oh, sleep, oh, won't you come away? Come away. Wake up, sleeper, open your eyes. Sinner, arise and leave your past at the door. Wake up, sleeper, come to the light. Christ is alive, death don't live here anymore. Wake up, sleeper. Wake up, sleeper.
church, follow Chris. This side of the church, follow me. We're doing open. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see. in and feel your presence. Lord God, I pray that you would show yourself, reveal yourself today in a very mighty and powerful way to us in this room. Father, for your word. We love you, Lord. And we just pray that you would enter the room, enter our hearts, Lord, and touch us. Leave, leave us, Lord God, different than when we, uh, when we came in here today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
for the next month looking, uh, looking at focus. Last week we talked about focus on our mind and how our minds have negative thoughts, positive thoughts, evil thoughts, bad thoughts, 
and we've talked about taking those captive for the kingdom. Today we're going to learn a little bit about our eyes in the process of focus because primarily the two things that go out of focus first is our mind and our eyes. And ultimately, Jesus is where we want our focus. Ultimately, that is where we want our gaze to fall upon. And that is the second part of what this series is. The first part was focus on the focus on the uh, the thought, the mind. This one is focusing in on Jesus. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14 uh, this morning, uh, just as we were last night. Uh, but what I want to give you is a little bit of the background. The passage that we're going to be in, Jesus had just fed the 5,000 with a couple of uh, fish and a couple of loaves of bread. It was already a big day. And they had this big day. Jesus sends the disciples on ahead of him just a little bit. He says, boys, I'm going to go up here to the mountain. I'm going to pray by myself. That type of thing is sprinkled throughout the, is peppered throughout the, the New Testament. Jesus going away and praying by himself. The Bible says in Matthew 14, 22 through 24, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, Jesus went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there all by himself, all alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because of the wind was against it. The weather started getting rough, and the tiny ship was tossed. After the miracle that Jesus had just done with the 5,000, he had told his disciples, boys, get in the boat, go ahead and cross over the Galilee. I'll catch up to you in just a minute. A nasty storm pops up, and that little boat begins to start rocking, and they start freaking out. And Jesus was nowhere to be found at the time. Jesus is MIA. It's, it's the disciples in the boat. But even when Jesus begins to walk out on the water, they're still freaking out. Matthew 14, 25 through 27. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the lake, they were terrified, and they said, It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. You see, the disciples thought that Jesus was a ghost. They did not recognize him. They didn't pick him out of a lineup. They didn't know who it was. All they saw was this figure walking towards them. And Jesus tells him, don't be afraid. Jesus takes care of first things first. And so the first thing he's going to do is he's going to take care of that fear and that anxiety and that trepidation. Let's look at three steps on how... Uh, three things that must be removed if we're going to see Jesus for who he is. So here we go. Hey, hey, ho, ho, fear has got to go. Fear is the first thing we're going to talk about today. Fear is the first thing that has to be removed if we're going to focus in on Jesus. Now, Jesus, as I said, dealt with first things first. And what the disciples were ahead of everything and anything is, man, they're scared. They are full of fear. And that fear had, take the fo had taken the focus off of Jesus. The big reason they were scared was because they couldn't see Jesus. The main reason they were scared is because they didn't feel his presence. The main reason they're scared is because they're going through this tremendous storm, and yet Jesus is not there with them. And even when he does show up, even when he does show up, they don't recognize him. Even when he does show up and he manifests they, they don't think that it's him. And these men had been rolling with Jesus for quite some time, y'all. They had seen Jesus feed the 3,000, the 5,000. They had seen Jesus give sight to the blind man and the, the dude who couldn't hear. Man, he can hear now. And the guy who, had a, uh, who, who was mute, Jesus had loosened his tongue. Jesus had done all the cool stuff. And Jesus had done all the cool stuff. And these disciples had been front row center on everything Jesus had done. And now they're out in this boat in the middle of the storm. And this one who had done all the healing and miracle work and in miracle catering business, he's walking out to them on the water. And they have no idea who it is. And they're scared. Church, when the stuff hits, when the stuff hits, it gets hard for us. To focus in on Jesus. When we're in the middle of the trouble and we're in the middle of the storm and we're in the middle of the struggle, it's sometimes hard to stay our focus and keep our focus on Jesus. It gets harder to see Him. It gets harder to focus on Him. You see, fear can make us lose our focus and it'll have us looking back and we'll think about our past mistakes and our past failures and we'll beat ourselves up because that's what fear wants us to do. Look back. Fear will have us look forward into the future and we'll think, oh my gosh, the future is not going to be any better than yesterday was. Tomorrow is not going to be any better than yesterday. But you know what, church? We're not even promised the future. We're not promised tomorrow. And even in the middle of the boat, those disciples in the middle of the storm, not just the pastor looking forward, but they were having a hard time focusing on Jesus in the here and now, in the middle of the storm. 
They were having a hard time keeping focus on him. Um, Y'all, a, a, fo- a fear will make us look back without seeing Jesus, look forward without seeing Jesus, and look at the right now without seeing Jesus. I'm going to tell you something about the disciples. It wasn't so much how they responded that was a problem. It's how they reacted. I'll tell you the difference between responding and reacting. And this is a, uh, this is a leadership lesson. It's called the cockroach theory. Um, but this is the difference between responding and reacting. Uh, let's say there's an open-air cafe, and a woman and her three friends have come in for the day, and they're having brunch, and they're having a great time. And as they're out in this open-air cafe, a, a bug, one of them flying roaches, kind of just flies in and flops right down to the middle of the table, flies right into the, uh, the uh, woman's salad, and she starts freaking out justifiably so she starts freaking out and the people at her table start freaking out because of this roach drop down and and they're outside it, 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 she starts dropping her fork and water is drink uh, water cups are falling over salad bowls are flying over the woman uh, one of the women takes her her salad that the bug had landed in she throws it up in the air lands on the next table there's another table with four women they start freaking out you know now the roach is on their table and all this is going on and the waitress is over here on the side of the wall watching all of it go down she saw the roach land on the front table, saw it land on the second table, sees everybody freaking. She goes up to that second table. She takes that salad plate and just calmly and coolly picks it up and takes it and throws it, throws it out. Throw, get, get rid of it. She said, hey, we're going to comp these meals. Ladies, enjoy the rest of, of your, your lunch. I want to have them bring out new food for you. We're going to clean up this mess and you guys have a great day. Now, the difference is this. The roach was doing what roaches do. The roach wasn't the problem. The roach was the distraction. The ladies reacted to the roach. When we react, we react out of emotion. When we react, we react out of feeling. When we react, we don't think, we don't contemplate, we just do it. And then we'll regret things later. But that's reacting. The woman, the waitress over there on the side, she didn't react. She responded. She thought about what was going on. She saw what was going on. She saw how everybody else was reacting and she came and she responded. Church, when I see the disciples in the boat, they are not responding, they are reacting. They are full of fear, they are full of anxiety, they are fear, uh, they are full of of uh, are we going to make it through this day? Are we going to make it through this storm? They are reacting and what Jesus wants them to do is to respond. Church, when we react, we really give away the only control we ever have. Because you see, we can't control distractions. We can't control the roach. All we can control is how we respond, how we act, how we respond to the distraction. It's not in preacher. What's all that mean? This is what that. This is what I want you to understand. It's not the shouting of your dad that's the issue. It's not the shouting of your boss that's the problem. It's not your spouse that's the issue. That. That might be the distraction, but they're not the problem. The problem is how do you respond to the shouting dad or the shouting boss or the shouting spouse? That's the issue. Another issue very well could be it's not the traffic jam that's disturbing you. It's not COVID-19. It's not online learning that's disturbing you. It's how you handle the disturbance. More than the problem, it's the handling of the problem that causes much of our chaos. We should always respond in life and react as little as possible. Reactions are impulsive. Reactions are emotion. They are our feelings. They're based on a response that is not well thought out. A response takes into consideration everything, but it doesn't jump. It waits. The church, here's the thing. You might mess this up, and chances are you will. We do all the time. Whether you respond when you should react or you react when you respond, I want you to know something. If you fail, you can recover. You can get back up and try it again, okay? This isn't a pass or fail thing. This is something we do every single day. So, hey, hey, ho, ho, fear has got to go. Let's look at the second thing. Hey, hey, ho, ho, distractions have got to go. For the disciples, the storm itself was the distraction that caused them to lose focus. Matthew 14, 29 through 30. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got out of the boat. He walked on the water, and he came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. 
he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Church, there are all kinds of distractions that took Peter's eyes off of Jesus. And church, there's all kinds of distractions in our life that do the same thing. Let me tell you something that I know about how the devil works in the church. If that old serpent can't destroy what God is doing, if he can't destroy what God is up to, if he can't destroy what God is anointing, if he can't destroy what God is doing in a town, if he can't destroy what God's doing in the church, then the devil will realize, hey, I can't destroy it, so let me distract him. Let me get him hung up on COVID. Let me get him hung up on, uh, on how decisions are made. Let me get him hung up on everything and anything but Jesus. Church, the devil knows he can't destroy what God is up to, so he'll just try to distract the saints of God. Church, this is exactly what the devil does, and this is exactly what the devil did to Jesus. Jesus had just come off a 40-day fast, a supernatural fast, had not drank, had not eaten anything for 40 days. He went away, and just for 40 days, he prayed to the Father immediately after he was baptized. Church, this is a little bit of a lengthier passage. I'm going to read the, uh, I'm going to read the odd, and I'm going to ask you to respond back with the even. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Church? The tempter, the old servant, the devil, came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones here to become bread. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. You know, if you give or you try to sell something that you don't have, that's called theft. Jesus is hearing the devil give him a bill of sale and the devil does not have the world to give. The devil doesn't have any of these things he's about to give Jesus. He, he's lying. All right. The Bible says this in verse nine. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Tim. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Satan knew exactly what the father was doing through the son. Satan knew exactly what was going on, what was going down. And he knew he couldn't destroy Jesus. He knew he couldn't destroy what God was up to. He knew he couldn't destroy the redemption plan of God. So he settled. If he couldn't destroy, then he'll settle for this. Let me distract. Jesus, <laughs> don't worry about the cross. Look at all these kingdoms. Look at all these, look at all these beautiful palaces. And look at all these empires. And, and look at all this. All of this can be yours. You see what he's doing? He's trying to distract Jesus. And just as Jesus kept his focus on the Father Church... He wants us, his disciples, to focus on him. How has the devil been trying to distract you lately? Now, with Peter, we know it was the winds and the waves. Those were his distractions. Even after he started walking on the water, he saw the distractions and he began to sink. Church, some of us are like old Pete, but some of us are still stuck in the boat, too. Some of us never even get out of the boat because we're too scared. Yo, what's keeping you in the boat? Is it the fear of being canceled? Is it the fear of being called out for not agreeing with culture? What's keeping you in the boat? Do you fear about being rejected or, or seen as no front fun or, or called a Jesus freak? What's keeping you in the boat? Peter knew that Jesus could keep him safe. He knew that Jesus could keep his head above water. He knew that Jesus could keep him from drowning. But he had to decide to get out of the boat and get to walking before that mattered. Church, as soon as Peter was getting going good, he started looking left and he started looking right. When I was writing these notes, that old Steeler's Wheel song came into my mind. Clowns to the left of me and jokers to my right. Here I am. And that's where I saw Peter. Winds to the right, waves to the left, and there Jesus is. And Peter begins to lose focus, and he begins to lose focus on Jesus, and he begins to sink. Scripture tells us that Pete begins to sink below the waves, and he calls out to one person to save him. It's not the, it's not the disciples. It's not one person in the boat. Jesus. Matthew 14, 31. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And he said, Pete, you have little faith. He said, why did you doubt? 
Jesus dealt with fear. Then he dealt with distractions. And finally, hey, hey, ho, ho, doubt has got to go. Fear, distraction, and now doubt. Peter started out so well, man. He got out of that boat and he started walking on the water. And in the middle of the storm, sure enough, that's when doubt hits. He began to doubt if Jesus would keep him safe. He began to doubt if Jesus would keep his head above water. He began to doubt if Jesus would keep him dry. And maybe you're wondering the same thing today. Maybe you're wondering, is Jesus going to go the distance with me? Is Jesus going to go with me through my marriage that's on the rocks? Will Jesus go through with me even though I'm failing financially? I'm failing professionally. I'm failing personally. I'm failing with my addiction. I'm failing with my dependence. I'm failing with my children. Will God leave me in the middle of those failures? Is God really in the middle of my storms? Church? We feel like we're being tossed by the winds and the waves and we get fearful and we get distracted by the storm. But I want you to understand, before Jesus shows up in the New Testament, we get an early promise in the book of Psalms that we need to be holding on to when we're looking at this idea of distractions. The Bible gives us this promise and it says in Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and God is our strength an ever-present help in trouble. Church, in Peter's instance, Jesus was so close to him, but all Peter could see was the wind. Jesus was so close to him, but all Peter could do was pay attention to the waves. Jesus was so close to him, and I wonder if we do the same thing. We're in the middle of our mess. We're in the middle of our storm. We're in the middle of our stuff, and we feel like we're alone. We feel like we're forgotten. We feel like we've been abandoned, and we forget that Jesus is with us in the middle of the storm. Now we forget. And that's easy to do. Why? Not because Jesus has gotten small, but we've got distracted. And we're fearful. We've seen other people go down. We've seen other people lose the fight. So we go sailing into the storm and we get convinced that Jesus is nowhere to be found. But church, listen to me. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we believe that Jesus is closer than we think He is. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we believe that Jesus is closer than we feel He is. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we think that Jesus is closer than we see with the eyes of our heart that he is. Now, Brother Mike, what's all that mean? It means this. If Jesus has told you he's going to be with you, whether you, feel like, whether you feel him or not, he's with you. Whether you think you see him or not, doesn't matter. He's promised to be there with you. So, church, you may be going through the valley of the shadow of death, but the Holy Spirit is inside you. That means that God is going through the valley with you. If you're in a valley of, 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 of uncertainty, you understand something. The Holy Spirit has went through that valley with you. You might be in a valley of addiction or a valley of failure or a valley of, of whatever. God goes through it with you. Maybe it's a valley of loss. Let me tell you something about doubt. <laughs> Listen to me. My doubt have killed more dreams in my life than the devil ever has. My doubt has killed more vision in my life than the devil ever has. My doubt has hamstringed me. My doubt has caused me problems. My doubt has messed things up. Christian, stop doubting your faith and start doubting your doubt. Okay, stop doubting your faith and start doubting your doubt because I want to tell you some truth. You are a son and a daughter of the king. Don't doubt it. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Don't doubt it. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't doubt it. You are created in the image of God. Don't doubt it. And still, all of these things, we say, yes, preach, yes. Why do we doubt who we are when God tells us who we are? You see, the thing is, the devil wants to tell us of all of our mistakes and all of our failures and all the times we slip below the waves. And Jesus is saying, yeah, I know all about that, but you're still my son. You're still my daughter. Oh, I know all the things you did, but you're mine. And nothing can take that away. Church, that's the focus we have on Jesus. Doubt your doubts before you doubt your beliefs. Uh, you can't control the storm. You can't control the roach. All you can control is your reaction or your response. Let me give you a gold nugget. I said this last, and I, I'll tell you all again. So much of these sermons, get uh, they just fall on the floor. They're just, I, they, don't, they don't fit. So I, I, I tell myself, oh, I'll use that in a sermon some other time. I'm not going to use it in a sermon some other time. I'm going to forget it, all right? So I really feel like I need to tell this to you now because there's a rowboat involved and a storm and all that. So this is, has nothing to do with a sermon I just preached. But let me tell you something. This is the gold nugget. You can write this down if you want to. 
in the church, only the people who aren't rowing have time to rock the boat. And usually the people who are rocking the boat don't give enough to buy an oar. And I tell you that because not every voice in the boat is worth listening to. Not every voice in the boat is worth listening to because I want you to understand something. Remember in that boat that Peter was in? There were 11 other disciples. Can I tell you what they were saying? What are you doing? Get back in there! I don't know about you. I would have rather walked 12 foot in the water and then sink and never get out of the boat. Because what that dude has is a testimony. Let me tell you about the time. I was going through a storm. And my Jesus called me out. And I walked. And I walked. And I walked. And when I fell, my Jesus saved me. There's your testimony. But you don't get that if you don't get out of the boat. You don't get that if you don't focus on Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Church, you've been so good to listen to me today. Thank you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We followed the disciples today, and we've caught, we got caught in a storm with them. Peter knew that the only thing he was going to get, the only way he was going to get to Jesus was to step out of the boat and to keep his eyes on him. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Church, the world wants us to focus on things of this world. If the world can get us to focus on wealth instead of Jesus, that's what it'll do. If the world can get us to focus in on things or wealth earthly pleasures then the world wants us to focus on those things instead of Jesus and Jesus is saying focus on me get rid of your fear get rid of your distractions get rid of your uh, get rid of your doubt so today I'm not asking you how will you respond uh, how you how will you react I'm challenging you how will you respond well preach how do I do that it means you're going to have to know what decision you're going to make before your storm comes. Practice how you will respond. Practice how you'll respond to when the world that you're walking in just kind of draw, uh, drops from underneath your feet. Or you know you're going to go see that coworker on Tuesday. And you're going to be working with that dude or that dudette and they just get on your last nerve. You need to decide right now, how am I going to respond to that person? You see, we've been watching the weather for a week to see how much snow we're getting, how bad the storm's going to be. Church, you know what storms typically, you know what kind of storms you're walking into this week. It's no big surprise. It's no big shocker. What if you begin to rehearse how you're going to respond? How you're going to rehearse how you're going to respond and still keep focus in on Jesus? Lord God, today I want to thank you for every person who's listened to this message, whether they are here in person or whether they're watching us online. Lord, I pray that we would focus in on you all the time. Lord God, that fear would be removed in the name of Jesus. Distractions would be removed in the name of Jesus. Doubt would be removed in the name of Jesus. Lord, let us respond in such a way that it exemplifies the faith and hope and confidence we have in you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all the church said? Amen. Amen. Y'all, we are going to be starting a connect, our connect groups uh, Tuesday, March 2nd online, and we're going through, uh, you'll get through this, Max Licato's book, it's an incredible book, uh, whatever this is, maybe you're going through a divorce, this is, that is your this, uh, maybe you're, maybe you got fired, then your firing is the this, uh, maybe you're just lonely, you'll get through this, uh, but it's an incredible book, we've been reading at the house, and it's a six-week study, uh, six weeks, you can do it online, or you can do it, um, in person, in person will be Wednesday nights at 6, uh, six o'clock here at the church. Um, online is Tuesday night at 6. And you can go to chesterfbc.org to register uh, for that class. And we're excited about this. It's going to be cool. Uh, connect groups is how you can uh, connect with other people, love other people here in the church. It's where you make relationships, so I encourage you to come. All right, this is what we're going to do. Brother Bryce, is that you, buddy, in the back? Brother Bryce Road is going to go first. Uh, don't go until the row behind you has left first. Yeah, that back row. Back row.